Thank you for listening to the weekly messages of New Providence Primitive Baptist Church. To subscribe to our podcast, hear other messages, or learn more about us, please visit nppbc.com. Turn with us this morning to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 11 will be our text today. Matthew chapter number 11. We'll begin at verse number 25 in just a few verses to read. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Bow with us. Father, thank you for your word. We pray you'd open our hearts to it, change us today with it. We know its power. God is the power of salvation. and May the gospel, the mystery of it, be revealed unto hearts that are here among us that those God may be having never heard it may hear it now for the first time in the heart, in the soul. We trust for this. God praying that you would speak to us all by it. We ask it believing as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus begins this passage thanking God, and certainly we're in a time of thanksgiving, but I'd... uh, I'd suggest today that Thanksgiving should be something that's common to us every day, that we recognize as we pray that it ought to begin with our Thanksgiving, our praise unto God. It ought to be something that is always on our lips, a word of Thanksgiving. But here specifically, Jesus thanks God for something that seems a bit mysterious. And to the world today, they don't understand it. And What we're going to read this morning is in part, at least, why they don't understand it. You see, the gospel is not not discerned mentally. It's not discerned uh, within the flesh, but it's spiritual. The gospel has always been spiritual. The Word of God is spiritual. What he tried to convince or to at least enlighten Nicodemus to was the fact that to be born again is something of the Spirit. You can't do it within yourself, and and trying to do it within yourself is what happens seemingly every day as men and women trust in things like religion or a baptism or the word of someone else or signing a card or joining a church or, or just being part of a Christian group. These are not things that can save you. There are things that are good within themselves and they're not, they're not wrong within themselves. But without the Spirit of God, you're not born again. You have to be born of the Spirit. And what Jesus is speaking here is a profound truth that many have failed to understand. And that is that you simply can't come to Christ at your own bidding. You don't just waltz into the throne room of God having not been invited. And that's where we find the importance of the passage today. Jesus had been teaching to many of them and and just the few verses right before. He had condemned Chorazin and Bethsaida for their wickedness as, as Jesus himself had gone through and had done so many wondrous works and yet they didn't repent. They didn't turn to God. Doesn't that sound familiar today? God is working, has been working, is always working. And yet what we find is so many have rejected him and continue to reject them. And Jesus 
Jesus in just a verse or two before would condemn them and say, you know, a Tyre and Sidon had seen what you've seen, they would have repented. Had Sodom and Gomorrah heard what you heard, they would have repented. Oh, what a condemnation. What an indictment on a culture of people that seen Jesus. They witnessed the power of all of his wonderful works. And you know what? They did not repent. How many of us today are in that same place? We have not repented unto God. And yet Jesus stands here having said these things just prior to such a foreboding condemnation upon those cities and those people. And yet in this very word in in verse number 25, we hear him say, but Lord, I thank you. He said, Lord, I thank you because you're the Lord of heaven and earth because you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent. Did you know today that so many of those that claim to know the gospel have never heard it? Their hearts have simply never received the truth of God's mystery in it. You say, you speak, preacher, as if this is some exclusive offer that God is giving. May I say today, you can't know God on your own. You've never looked for God. You've never hungered for God or sought for God. The only hope you have, friend, is that God comes to you. He said, I thank you, Lord, of heaven and earth. You're in charge of it all, he said. And I thank you that you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent. Now, You might say, preacher, I thought God wanted everyone to be saved. Let me be clear. It is not his will that any perish. But let's also be clear that God only saves those who come of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Those that are the wise and the prudent of this world, you will miss heaven. You will miss it altogether because you stand in your own intellect. You stand in your own abilities. You stand and think to yourself that I have done this and I have done that and therefore merit the favor of God somehow. No, the Bible has concluded that all are under sin and every one of us are sinners in the eyes of God. We're not worthy of heaven. We're not worthy of heaven. Jesus makes a profound statement here. He said, God, thank you. So said, I'm so grateful that you hadn't revealed this to the wise and the prudent. You hadn't made this mystery clear to the wise and the prudent, to those in this world who think that their wisdom somehow equates to a spiritual authority or a spiritual rightness before God. Jesus himself said, God, thank you. Thank you that it's hid from them, that they can't see it. <laughs> He said, but that you've revealed it unto babes. <laughs> yeah, I don't care if you're 50 years old when, or 100 years old. If you get to the place in your life that you become broken before God and you recognize that your sin is real and that you are guilty before God, may I say to you today, you're getting into a place where he might speak. He may reveal unto you that you need him and that you're unsaved and that you without him are going to die and end up in that awful place called hell. He thanked God that the spirit and and that the word of God, this mystery of this gospel wasn't revealed unto the wise of the world, the prudent of the world, but he reveals it unto babes. You say, what is a babe when we refer to in this past? What does that mean? May I say to you today that a little child is ignorant and unlearned. (laughs) That's how he finds all that will be born again is in their own ignorance and unlearned. You see, when he called the disciples and they stood that day having received the Spirit of God and they stood and they preached the gospel of Christ, what the Pharisees had to do was that they had to take knowledge that these men were ignorant and unlearned men and yet they preached. And they declared the gospel of Christ. Oh, he would go as far in the epistles to share the apostle Paul would how that God hasn't chose many wise. He hadn't chose many foolish, but no, he chose rather just to receive those who were of a meek heart 
those who were of a broken spirit, those who were humble of nature, those who weren't willing to look within themselves as it being part of the answer, but that they themselves were depraved and without hope other than Christ himself. Listen, there isn't a substitute for Jesus Christ today. He is and remains the only means of salvation. The wise and the prudent will miss this. They will miss this and to this Jesus said, thank you. Thank you that you hadn't revealed it unto the wise and the prudent. Oh, but thank you that you have shown the ignorant and the unlearned. Let me go on record today that I am so glad that the gospel of Jesus Christ comes to the ignorant. I've nothing today to boast of. I don't have anything, friend, to stand in. Even if I had went to a seminary, which I'm not against seminaries, but even if I had went to a seminary, I want to be a thousand percent clear that has nothing to do with my relationship with Jesus Christ. Often these are the things that keep a man from knowing him, their own understanding, their own intellect. These are the things that prohibits the Spirit of God to do the work of Christ in the heart of a wise and and prudent man. And Jesus would go on record and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you that this gospel that is so mysterious that you, Lord of heaven and earth, you've hid it. You've hid it. Amen. They can't see it. Uh, Look around you. You got thousands upon thousands and millions and millions across this world. They cannot see Christ. How come? Because they've been learning. And in their own wisdom, the apostle would say in the book of Romans, their own wisdom would be the very thing that kept them from God. Jesus would say, thank you, Lord, that you've not revealed it. You've hid it from the wise and the prudent. Oh, he said, but you've revealed it unto babes. <laughs> thank you, God that you would reveal such a mysterious and glorious gospel to this man, Peter, (laughs) who ain't nothing but a rough fisherman, ain't never known anything, probably been in trouble more than he's not. He said, but I thank you that you shared it with him. Ain't you glad, Craig? It wasn't about you. It wasn't about what you knew. Blessed be the name of God. Some of you sit here today maybe in your past religious attitude and you have some kind of inclination that God needs you. God ain't ever needed me. But thanks be to God, he came to a babe one day. Something that was ignorantly and unlearned, he came to me. And I'll tell you what he did. He revealed unto my soul the way of Christ. It would seem, you see, that there is something to be said about the revelation that must occur for a man to know Christ. In verse 25, he said, Thank you that you've hid it from those that are wise and prudent, but you've revealed it unto somebody like me and Steve. You've revealed it unto somebody like Jerry and Roger. You've revealed it unto somebody that is ignorant and unlearned, who is unworthy of all of it. And yet you, in your plan, even so, Lord, he said, as you seemed it, it was good to you. That it was your will. It was your will that this is how men would come to Christ. Not... <laughs> Not in their wisdom. (laughs) Listen to me today. If you're holding on to anything but the blood of Jesus Christ, turn loose. Turn loose. Because the glory of serving Christ is not in what you know, but in who you know. Oh, bless his name. Saying to us in verse 25 that those that do hear and receive the mystery of the gospel of Christ. It has been revealed unto them by God. Now you see the separation. 
between the wise and the prudent and the simple unlearned, the broken, the, the weary, the unlearned. And Jesus would say, even so, God, as, as, as you ordained this plan from the very beginning, but then he begins in verse number 27. Let me read it to you. He said, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. Now, let me be clear. God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. <laughs> they are one. There's not one bigger than the other or greater than the other. They are one. And yet they are three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus comes right back in verse number 27. He had just referred to in verse 25 the Lord as being the Lord of heaven and the Lord of earth. And he had all power. And in verse 27, Jesus comes right back and he says, And all this power you have given unto me. All of it you've given unto me. Let me be clear and establish today that the Lordship of Jesus Christ cannot be overdone. It cannot be outdone. There is none, friend, but him. And he alone is the one that can save you. He makes it clear. Yes, God is in control of all things. And God is the one that must reveal unto the babes of this world the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He said, but also let me share something else with you. That God has given me all power. He said, we are one in this. And he said, no one is able to know the Son. He was speaking of himself. Look at your Bibles. It's red letters. Jesus was speaking of himself. He said, no one is able to know me but the Father. And he said, by the way, no one is able to know the Father but the son, me. But I like that he added an and right there. Huh? Look at your Bibles. Rejoice with me for just a minute. That Jesus didn't stop right there, Stella. He said, and. He said, and. He said, nobody can know me but the Father. And nobody can know the Father but me. But he said, and. All of those for whom I reveal him to them. You say, preacher, it sounds like this whole thing of coming to Christ is based upon a revelation. Amen. The Bible said it was God that revealed unto babes this mystery of Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus Christ that reveals unto you the mystery of God. He's trying to save you today. But listen to me. It comes to those who have a heart that's ready to receive it. That's not the wise and the prudent. But that is the ignorant, the unlearned, the broken, the humble, the contrite of spirit. God will reveal to you himself. Say, what happened to you when you got saved, preacher? That's about what happened. (laughs) I was minding my own business. (laughs) My parents were there the night I got saved. Kenneth and Mildred was there the night I got saved. I don't know if anybody else, maybe Judy was there when I got saved. I don't remember everybody. But I'll tell you, I didn't come to get saved that night. (laughs) I didn't come for Christ. I wasn't looking for Christ. I didn't know I was lost. Had no idea. I came. I was made to come to church. I come in the church. I sit in the back right back there. And I was minding my own business. (laughs) I wasn't causing any trouble. I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing anything. I was just sitting there. But there was something happened. There was somebody showed up in the bench with me. And you know what? Just like that. He revealed him to me. And suddenly I knew in his presence that I was now a sinner. And that I needed him to save me. You say, how in the world can and that happened to a nine-year-old boy. It is by divine revelation of God. God have mercy on the many a sanctuary that bid you to come without a revelation. What I'm saying is is that the offer of salvation is exclusive. Even if I wanted to say, 
even if I had the power to say, all you got to do, all you got to do is to bow on this altar right up here. Believe in Christ. Be baptized. Join the church. Serve Christ. But even if I had the power to declare that, let me be clear, nobody can hear it but those to whom it's been revealed. We could go on and on because everybody's testimony is just like that. You didn't know you was lost until he showed up at your house. He showed up in your heart. And suddenly what was revealed unto you was the mystery of the gospel. And what he was doing was giving you the opportunity to be saved. Our testimonies are different, but they're the same. Because the truth is, is except you come as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, he said, I'm grateful that you haven't, that you haven't just squandered this message to the wise and the prudent. He said, they don't want it. But he said, I'm so proud that you have given it to the ignorant and the unlearned of us. You see, the world even today may consider us ignorant and unlearned. The world today may look at how we act and say, well, that's the most foolish thing that I've ever seen. And I would contend that the foolishness of the gospel is to them that perish. It is foolishness. The preaching of the word of God is to many foolishness. But listen, that doesn't make any difference because what matters is that it's by revelation that you know of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I don't know. I don't know that this is the very day for one of you sitting among us. This is right, the, right now at this moment, one of you may be dealing with the Spirit of Christ in your heart. It is just revealed to you that you're lost. It is just revealed to you that you're going to go to hell without Christ. It is just revealed to you that Christ wants to save you. It is just revealed to you and nobody around you knows what's going on. Nobody knows the battle that you're fighting right now. Nobody knows the warfare that is going on for your precious soul. But let me be clear. You can be saved when the revelation comes. Because I can assure you when the revelation comes, then the door is opened. You suddenly have a golden scepter being pointed your direction. You have a period of grace that is being extended unto you. You say, preacher, I ain't worthy. <laughs> Babe. You say, preacher, I ain't, I ain't learned. A babe. You say, preacher, I've never been to church. I've done a million horrible things. I've cursed God. I've done. Listen, you're just a babe. You don't understand it yet. But the revelation is bringing you to a simple consciousness that you need Christ. And brother, if you'll come, sister, if you'll come, person, if you'll come to Christ today, if he's dealing with you, he'll save you. He'll save you. But it is by revelation. I've given a thousand a thousand or more, I have more than that, invitations. But those are just words if Christ is not dealing with you. Right? Those are just expectations or anticipations that God is dealing with someone in our midst this morning because he does not want them to go to hell. He's not dealing with everybody here today. But he may be dealing with one. And you know what that means to that one? It means today is the day, not tomorrow. Right now, this moment is the moment when Christ has revealed unto you, God has revealed unto you, and you now have a knowledge, you now have an understanding that what Jesus Christ did was to bring salvation for you, for you. Thank God. We have, friend, revelation, and it is given through the Spirit of Christ. The Bible would say in John 6, I think it was Jesus said, no man can come unto the Father except he's drawn. Right? No, no man, he said, can come unto me except the Father draw him. And we find in the Word of God how important it is that, that even in our own hearts, the Spirit of God does a working in us. 
The Spirit of God begins to reveal to us the mystery of that gospel and suddenly what we didn't know. Some of you are sitting here today with a testimony that you were born again at five years old or six years old or seven years old or nine years old or ten years old. Some of you have a testimony that you were 30-something years old or 40-something years old or 50-something. You you see, the testimonies are different, but it all happened the same way. There was a day came in your life that God revealed unto you the truth about Jesus Christ. And that truth awakened your conscience to the opportunity. Not everyone will receive Christ. No. As a matter of fact, the Bible is clear that most will reject Him. But it is also clear, according to Titus 2 and verse number 11, that the grace of God which bringeth salvation. You say, how does the grace of God bring salvation? It is through divine revelation. That's how it happens. Listen, I get preached my guts out. I do multiple times a week. And it ain't very many that somebody comes and gets saved. But there is always the opportunity. You know why? Because the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us. Teaching us, right? Yeah, you're ignorant and unlearned and so are we. But that's where the Spirit of God comes to and that's to whom it reveals himself to. And if you today can do the simple thing that Jesus has declared, if you can believe, you see, in the death, the the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you can believe that he shed his blood in remission for your sins, not your neighbor, but your sins, you can be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved. But it's by revelation. There's been many people come to this altar that thought they got saved. And they thought they got saved because they did the same thing that their neighbor did who claims to be saved. But let me be clear. Emotion is not how you get born again. It's not because you shed a tear. It's not because you're guilty of your sin and you're worried about going to hell. You get saved by revelation of Jesus Christ who reveals unto your soul the need. Because it's your soul, you see, that's in the balance. It's not your intellect. It's not your mind. It's, it's not those things that bear upon, one's, uh, bear upon one's mind. No, it's about something of the heart. So the disciples asked a question one time. Jesus told, he he shared a simple truth with them. He said, it's extremely hard for a rich man to go to heaven. That shocked them. They thought all them rich Pharisees were going to heaven. Jesus said, nope, nope, they're not. He He said, it's so hard. He said, it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. Impossible. He said, but with God, all things are possible. There are certainly rich people that are saved. Sure there are. Because with God, all things are possible. But let's be clear. The only way they could get saved was the same way you got saved. And that was by revelation of God into their own hearts. Now, you say, Preacher, why in the world do we... Why, what, what, why is this so important? Listen, because without it, you'll never be saved. You can come pray a thousand prayers, but until the revelation of Christ has come to you, I'm talking about the drawing of God that reveals unto you your condition. It's not your neighbor, not your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister. It's you. And when your soul recognizes that he has spoke to you, that's the day. That's the moment for you to be saved. So Jesus in these three verses, gives them a very exclusivity. exclusivity. He, he speaks to them in such a way to say that not everyone can hear what I'm telling you. And yet in Revelations, we find over and over, he says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. All right, who's going to hear? The babes. And I'm, I'm not talking about one's age. I'm talking about one's heart. The babes the unlearned, the ignorant. That's who can hear. The wise and the prudent, they're going to miss it. God's hid it from them, by the way. 
but to, the, but to those that are meek and lowly among us. He's able to, by revelation, so that they can hear. And so that brings us to this place where Jesus himself gives the invitation. Not somebody else. Jesus gives the invitation. He tells them that it, that it is by divine revelation that, you must, that you're going to be saved. If you get saved, it'll be because Christ spoke to you. Then he gives them the actual invitation. The revelation must come. But when the revelation comes, here's what you're going to find. In every revelation of God to you is there's an invitation. To what? To come. That's right. To come. And so Jesus would say in in verse number 28, he would say, come unto me. All of you that labor yeah, that, that, that word labor means overburdened with toiling. Overburdened. And, and I'm not talking about you physically, right? Some of you say, I have to work too long. I, and that's, I'm not, that's not what we're talking about. When he says, come unto me, all of you that labor for your soul, who are overburdened with toiling concerning your eternity, All of you that are worried to death about when you die, what's going to happen. All of you that labor over this. He said, come. Come unto me. Don't come unto the preacher. Don't come unto the church. No, he said, you got to come to me. You have got to go to me, he said. Come unto me, all ye that labor. And he said, are heavy laden laden down with the burden of your sin, overburdened with the understanding that you have violated the laws of God and that you'll stand before him one day and give an account for your lives. Friend, it doesn't matter who you are or what you think or what you believe. Everyone will stand before God one day. The question is whether or not you have been born again. And that has nothing to do with the flesh. That is something that must happen to the inward man, the soul of man. And so that's why Jesus speaks not to the flesh, but he's speaking to the weary souls. He's speaking to those that are suddenly realized, do you understand what a turmoil it is to be under conviction yet? I remember it. (laughs) I remember the terror that filled my soul just that fast. I remember the understanding that I had not before I walked through those doors and before the Holy Ghost of God dealt with me. I didn't understand that truth. But at the moment of revelation, I began to see. And it began, it came so clear, Gavin, I began to tremble. Why? Because there was a realization that there was something in me he wanted And if I didn't surrender to Christ, I would die without Christ. And that terror, that terror was the labor (laughs) and the heavy laden. You say, but I thought you got saved when he called you. I did. I just didn't tell you how long I labored. Some of you put it off. And you went a day or you went a week, or you went a month before you ever surrendered to Christ. By the way, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you did it. But I know this much, if you have turned Christ away and he is back today, and he's calling you, I know the labor and the burden you're carrying right now. And it is the worst. It is the greatest that a man can bear is to know the truth that if you reject Christ, you have chosen hell. That is the toil 
That is the labor. You say, how do you know for sure that he is speaking concerning the soul? Aren't you glad you got a Bible? Read the next verse. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And he said, I will give you rest. Maybe, preacher, he's referring to my being overworked in the flesh. No. No, he comes right back in the next verse. And he's very clear. He's very clear. He follows up with what Jeremiah said in 616, where he said to seek ye out the old path and see and ask the old path and the good way. And he said, when you find it, he said, walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. What is, it, what is he saying in, in verse number 29? Verse 28, he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. But in 29, he comes back. He tells them clearly. He tells them clearly, look, what I'm trying to offer you will bring rest to your soul. The flesh will be planted in this graveyard one day. And one day resurrected by the power of Christ with a new body. That makes it distinctly different from the soul. When God saved me, he didn't save my flesh. That's why on the outside, I'm not perfect. What he saved was the inside, the soul, the soul. And so Jesus says in verse number 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Do you want to know what keeps you up at night? It's your soul, friend. It's your soul. It's not insomnia. It's it's likely your soul that says you have an appointment with God. What will you do? And when the revelation of Jesus Christ comes to us, we recognize that it's our soul he's after. You have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Come get a song. As I've thought about the invitation over and over, as I've thought about what can I say that might cause you to consider that what what we're sharing today is about eternity. It is about forever and ever for you. It became ever clear to me again that I could, I could give a thousand invitations to you. But until the Holy Spirit of God deals with you and you choose Christ, you'll remain unsaved. So here's a simple invitation. If the Spirit of God is dealing with your heart right now, and I'm talking about dealing with your heart, your soul, the essence of who you are for all of eternity. If that's what's going on right now, I don't know about it. Your neighbor don't know what's going inside. They have no idea the the struggle, the fight, the battle that is going on in your heart right now as you've experienced the revelation of the Holy Spirit speaking truth to you, and you now know truth. You now know if I die without Christ, I am going to hell. I'm going there. I know what that feels like. Every saved person in this room knows what that feels like. We've been in that agony. We have been in that battle where the flesh fights to hold on, and yet the soul says, no, we must have Christ. So it just got real clear. Jesus said, come. You know what that means? It means in the very least, you've got to come. 
I'm just going to sit here. You'll go to hell. How come? Because he said, come. Did he ask you to be a lawyer or a doctor or to have a million in the bank? No. No. He said, just as you are, ignorant and unlearned, come unto me. Do you know the prodigal didn't get help till he went back home? He went back home. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, the Bible said that all that heard him were pricked in their heart, and they said, Sirs, what must we do? What, what do I need to do next? The old Philippian jailer, he found himself in his own mess, right? He was toiling and struggling and seeing those. He was willing to take it. He was fixing to kill himself with his own sword. Paul said, stay your hand. He said, we're all here. Ain't nobody escaped. And you know what he did? He ran. He ran just fast as he could. He ran into that prison, into that jail cell, and he fell down in front of the apostle Paul, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul told him, he said, Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But he had to come. He had to come. Preacher, what do I need to do today? All I know is that Jesus said, you need to come to me, to Christ. And he'll do the rest. He'll fix what's wrong in your heart today. But you're going to have to come. It does require a response to be saved. You have to respond. As we stand and sing, if you're here this morning and you need Christ, let me compel you. It's not his will that any should perish. He wants you to be saved today. But you're going to have to respond, you see. You're going to have to respond to the revelation of truth that is now in your heart that you now know is real because you feel it in there. You know he's spoken to you. His voice has been clear. And it's now on your own conscience. You know who he is. You have to come. Would you come? Would you come to Christ? That may mean you fall down right where you're at and call on him. Doesn't make any difference where you get saved. What matters is that you come to Christ to get saved. As we sing, would you come? We'll pray with you.